Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kim Schoenholtz. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's panel on the LIBOR transition. The host of today's program is the Stern Center for Global Economy and Business, which serves the university through outreach to the broader community, including the academic, business, and policy worlds, as well as students and alumni. So let me now introduce our distinguished panelists one by one. Catherine Judge is a professor at Columbia Law School and an expert on financial markets, financial regulation, and regulatory architecture. Prior to Columbia, Professor Judge clerked for Judge Richard Posner of the Seventh Circuit and for Justice Stephen Breyer of the Supreme Court. She received her JD with distinction from Stanford Law School. And together with Professor Wachter, who is sitting next to her, Professor Judge co-chaired the working group on the LIBOR transition of the Financial Research Advisory uh, Council of the Office of Financial Research at Treasury. Susan Wachter is the Albert Sussman Professor of Real Estate at the Wharton School. Previously, she served as Assistant Secretary for Policy Development and Research in the U.S. Department of Housing and Development. Today, Professor Wachter directs the Wharton Geographical Information Systems Lab and co-directs the Penn Institute for Urban Research, both of which she helped found. Together with Professor Judge, she co-chaired the working group on the LIBOR transition of the OFR uh, Financial Research Advisory Council. Tom Whiff, the far end, is the chair of the Alternative Reference Rates Committee, the group of private market participants convened by the Federal Reserve to help guide the transition from LIBOR in the United States. Tom also is vice chair of institutional securities at Morgan Stanley, where he has worked for over three decades, helping to fund and hedge the firm's activities. He also chairs the CFTC's Interest Rate Benchmark Reform Subcommittee and serves on the board of the International Swaps and Derivatives Association. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished panelists. So, Tom will now begin the presentations, followed by Professors Judge and Wachter in that order. After their brief remarks, we'll start the Q&A session. Okay. Thank you very much, Kim. I think we're, to start this topic off, I mean, this is a, a wide-ranging topic, and we've seen uh, to some degree uh, where we start on this can lead down a lot of roads. So I think I'd like to just begin by saying for those uh, not as involved in the day-to-day -day workings of LIBOR transition, we can give a brief overview of sort of how we arrived here. Uh, unsecured reference rates like LIBOR, URIBOR, uh, et cetera, are widely used in the global financial system and have been for quite some time. Uh, and through a broad range of financial products and contracts, uh, cash bonds, derivatives, mortgage product, consumer loans, uh, and on, uh, from complex derivatives to residential mortgages. In USD LIBOR alone, the Fed estimates that total exposure to LIBOR uh, is over 200 trillion in assets and liabilities that reference this rate. Uh, globally, uh, total uh, LIBOR exposures uh, are reported at over 370 trillion. So what, uh, what we've really arrived at here is how did this problem develop? Uh, LIBOR, the first uh, use of LIBOR was in 1969. It was uh, credited to a Greek banker by the name of Minos Zambanakis, who in 1969 arranged an $80 million syndicated loan uh, from manufacturers Hanover to the Shah of Iran. And basically several banks contributed to this idea of, of how to get a funding cost uh, reference rate that could be used in other instruments on floating rate debt in particular. As time passed, uh, this rate became very popular. It was run by the British Bankers Association. The British Bankers Association would collect uh, observation on rates and actual rates from a, a series of panel banks. Today there are 19 panel banks that remain, but uh, across uh, over that time there are probably many more. What the banks would do is they would take their interbank trades, so if banks were borrowing and lending from each other, they would take their interbank trades, they would submit them. If they didn't have a trade, they would pretty much you know, be able to extrapolate a curve on where that rate might be over a series of points on the curve, overnight, one week, 
uh, one month, three month, and onward. That was the basis of LIBOR. And there was a very, uh, I'd say, an active interbank lending market to support that. So for most panel banks, all they had to do was look at the trades that they had done in the interbank market, put them on a spreadsheet, send them into the British Bankers Association, who would then calculate that with an algorithm they had to trim out highs and lows and basically would produce the rate that we know as LIBOR today. Uh, moving quickly through time, uh, what happened is that the, uh, the actual underlying uh, interbank lending has really kind of ground to a halt. Uh, as banks real began to fund longer post-crisis, uh, the reliance on the interbank market has gone down. Uh, the regulatory framework does, uh, penalizes uh, those who borrow and does not reward those who lend short term. So with wholesale short term funding sort of out of business for the most part, uh, what we saw was that the banks became more and more reliant uh, on their submissions being from basically from guesstimates or other, other uh, algorithms that they use, but no underlying transactions. So at the, at the, at the height of this, we arrived at a point where uh, less than 500 million in actual transactions were representing over 370 trillion of assets and liabilities. That really uh, sort of set the tone for what we, dis what we saw in 2012, which was the ability to manipulate this rate and the scandals that you saw and the criminal cases and the fines that have been paid were really driven by this concept of what we call uh, an inverse pyramid, right? If you think about the fact that you've got a half a billion in transactions supporting 370 trillion uh, in assets and liabilities, it's, it's not too hard to move that curve. Uh, as we see. And this, is, this has really been the fundamental break. So when we think about what uh, global regulators saw when they went to look at LIBOR was clearly how could, you, how could you create a better system where this rate could no longer be manipulated, which is, first, which is the first stop on the train. The second stop really was looking at it saying it really is not a sustainable model to have submitted rates that have no underlying transactions supporting so much, uh, so much uh, activity. So central banks globally uh, and global regulators have spent the fa last few years assembling private sector working groups like the ARC uh, to devise and implement strategies aimed at transferring risk in the financial system away from LIBOR, uh, these un less safe rates, and into safer, more durable rates that are based on actual transactions. So progress varies on a jurisdictional basis uh, with each currency zone subject to its own challenges and constraints, uh, but today we'll focus on the transition away from U.S. Uh, dollar LIBOR. The key, the key topics we'd like to touch on include the work that's happening at ISDA. ISDA is obviously the trade group that is going to support the, the derivatives market. The derivatives market, uh, represent, the swaps market represents about 85 to 90 percent of the notionals that track the LIBOR, so it's an important consideration in terms of the work they do. Uh, and these are certainly top of mind for practitioners working through the LIBOR transition. Uh, and also to set the stage is a few of the key developments that we've seen in the last three months. So when, this, when these groups were put together around 2014, there's been a series of uh, efforts put together to create, uh, to create an environment where we could uh, identify new rates, create those new rates in a way that were durable and, and, uh, and credible uh, and would build confidence and then begin to take people off LIBOR uh, and onto the new rates. So, there have been several regulatory developments that have really moved this into the front into the front of mind. So an enormous amount of work has been done over these years, but now as we approach the end of LIBOR, which is scheduled for the December 31st, 2021, we're beginning to see some very key developments that I would say take us into the second act, deep into the second act of a three-act play. So what we see is uh, over the last few weeks, FASB has voted to provide accounting relief for those who want to convert away from LIBOR, uh, so we don't have an accounting challenge to that. The SEC recently uh, released guidance, and I think uh, we discussed that before we got here, on the appropriate disclosures that if, uh, if uh, mutual funds or broker-dealers have exposure to LIBOR, what should they be disclosing to their stakeholders? What should they be disclosing to their board? Uh, so that's very important. Uh, the mortgage market and the consumer market is actually something that has to be held to the highest standard of care. So what we see is that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have developed products, that will be developing products that will reference SOFR. So uh, in, instead of getting a, a, a mortgage today that would reference LIBOR, in the future uh, the GSEs will be producing these that reference SOFR, uh, which will obviously move the consumer market, which is obviously a critical component here. Uh, in terms of the, in terms of the, uh, the tre U.S. Treasury, 
Uh, their borrowing committee, which is the group that basically advises them, has suggested that the Treasury could issue a, float, a floating rate note based off SOFR. So we're beginning to see uh, a lot from the official sector and the quasi-official sector. IOSCO has advised uh, broadly people in the markets that the best way to, uh, to avoid a problem with LIBOR is to have less of it, is to convert and to move on to the new rates as soon as possible. Last week, the Financial Stability uh, Oversight Committee, FSOC, discussed the LIBOR transition at their September meeting, and we look forward to seeing the minutes on that. That's important because, as you'll hear, I think, as we go through this, uh, the regulatory uh, focus on this is, go is only going up. Uh, we also think that we potentially would get some tax guidance, which would help people to do this, so removing the barriers to conversion is coming up. Uh, and, a, and, and pretty much now, all the tools are in place for those who do want to transition away from LIBOR. Uh, basically, the ARC has provided details how to create an, uh, an ARM, uh, an adjustable rate mortgage product. This is very important to the consumer end of this. Uh, the central clearing houses have laid out what they're calling a big bang or a single step approach to converting existing trades from LIBOR to SOFR or from Fed funds to SOFR on a discounting basis. And this project, I think, you know, included a number of lessons applicable for, for this room today. The LIBOR transition is one of the most extensive projects that I've ever seen. I think it's been described as one of the biggest financial engineering jobs in, in history. Uh, David Bowman uh, from the Fed Board of Governors, who, has, who leads the ARC uh, from, from that side, has basically described this as a couple of Y2Ks. Uh, so we're really thinking of something that touches pretty much every part of the financial system, uh, clients, institutional uh, clients, consumers. And it provides an interesting lens how different clients have different requirements, priorities, and how putting clients first means having to adapt our businesses to these respective groups. It's global in nature. It's a good example how global organizations manage risk uh, across geographies as fact patterns in those areas diverge. The transition has formed, uh, transformed really from theoretical to practical as we begin to implement new products on the new rates. And finally, uh, this has been, I think, so far, a real model of uh, public sector, private sector coordination, uh, and will continue to be until we get this transition over the finish line. Uh, so with that, I will uh, pass on down to Kate. All right. Great. So let me get the uh, slides up for you. Yeah. A All right. Well, I have to admit, I was going to share the same 1969 story, so we should have coordinated better. I'm sorry. Better. I apologize. But it's a great story to share <laughs> because I think it actually is critical to understanding where we are now. And I think that more often than you would think in finance, there's this idea that kind of markets come to optimal solutions, but history is incredibly important and path dependency shapes a lot where you get to. So you can't understand how LIBOR worked, why it was structured as it was, and how it became as pervasive as it was without understanding a little of that history. And as Tom just pointed out, what this started out with is a time of really club finance. So it was the very early stages of global finance. I mean, there's always been global finance in one form or another. But this was the early stages of a new level of global finance, where you actually had a British bank wanting to make a loan to the Shah of Iran that was dollar-based dollar and with a floating interest rate. Like This, this was the, the era of finance that we are now in. And so the tool that they came up with, the way it was structured, though, was later formalized by the British Bankers Association was based on this informal set of norms and the legal language was structured such that you could effectively say, if you had to borrow, how much would you pay for this denomination and for this duration? And it was this structure, because it was originally a, a, a clubby environment, mm -hmm that allowed it to be that, first of all, it grew to spaces where there was never a lot of underlying volume. Right. right. And then after the crisis, where as a result of both market changes, but also a significant regulatory changes, the way banks had traditionally fund themselves, which was not predominantly, but at least in, in meaningful part, unsecured term financing, is just not how banks continue to fund, each other, fund themselves. So I'm actually going to start now because of just the way I want to do this. With, with slide two. So what we're seeing here, and this actually to Kim credit, he put this together, and he did so using ARC data. And let me just commend to you, if you are interested in this topic and you haven't spent time on the ARC website, it is incredibly rich. They have working groups working at all kinds of different dynamics of the issues. They have the old minutes. You can learn about the processes that they have been going through, not only with ARC 2.0 that, that Tom currently is heading, but, but the original 
uh, ARC 1.0. And so just the, the, the richness of the materials that are there are the practical questions, as he pointed out. I mean, David Bowman has wonderful things. You want to use SOFR? Here's how to do it. So it's great to have a single resource. Rarely do you have a single resource that brings together both the background and the challenges and the how-to. And right now, the ARC website has a lot of that. So one of the things that they have is some background information illustrating this inverted pyramid that Tom referred to. And what that means is once we had these questions about LIBOR and it came out, it was exposed through the 2012 scandals. It was exposed because what we had was a structural problem. We had a structural problem because we had this $200 trillion market just for US dollar LIBOR based on an incredibly thin amount of actual transactions. And again, that's what creates the incentive and the opportunity to engage in this opportunistic behavior. If you have a thick underlying activity, then you don't have the ability, because they do have mechanisms of cutting off tails, to have this type of abuse that actually could, could result in, in benefits. And so here's where we actually see. So on the left, it's actually understated. What we're seeing here is the median daily trading volume of all GSIBs, not just the, the panel banks, mm -hmm. but all GSIBs. So if you want to look at the largest, which should be at least potentially the safest bank, these are all of the GSIBs. And the other thing to note is not only is this all of the GSIBs, but it's not just the inner bank trading. I mean, you could say, look, we're used to a three-month unsecured term. We could also get that through a like, three-month the commercial paper. <coughs> they got this data after we also made the changes to money market mutual fund reforms. They weren't thinking about this when they changed money market mutual fund reforms. But it means now money market mutual funds don't want to buy up banks' commercial paper because effectively no institutional investors want to hold money market mutual funds backed by private paper because of changes that the SEC made to deal with challenges, again, exposed during the crisis. So it's not just that banks aren't lending to each other, it's that unsecured term financing, which is what led to the pervasive use that was what was meant to back things like three-month LIBOR, is not how banks fund themselves. So the first instinct to say, like, okay, if LIBOR is not working, can't we fix it with something that looks a lot like LIBOR? Because the thing that's cl most close to LIBOR is going to look really similar. Or LIBOR itself, why not just fix LIBOR? Yeah. You're going to say, well, that seems like a lot easier. So just a background point, because I think a lot of the questions I've noticed go to this, is the reason we don't have something that looks a lot like LIBOR, or we're not just trying to fix LIBOR, is that's just not how banks fund themselves today. And this chart shows, again, the volume across these different types of of instruments relative to just how thin. And so the proportions are such that it's inviting the opportunity for opportunist behavior. It was not just in how LIBOR was structured. It was not specific to the, the individuals involved in those scandals. It was a setup for abuse. And so this is why we had to look for alternative types. And this is why we went from an IBOR to a, reference, a, 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 a secured reference rate. And, and Susan's going to talk a little more about that. And just one other quick note. So this was the background structural thing. And then it did lead to a number of different developments long before kind of the Bailey speech. So I also go, the, in, you issued the, the set, set, statement of principles saying, like, here's what we care about as a starting point for a reference rate. When ARC did they, their work, they went above and beyond that. They're like, we'll start with IOSCO. Mm -hmm. But there's other things we care a lot about, too. So there is, first you have to say, if we want to have a robust reference rate, because LIBOR failed, you want to come up with a bunch of standards. You don't want to just go from one to another. We want to avoid being in this situation again. So you had to enumerate a bunch of standards. That was an international conversation initially. And then the various jurisdictions layered on top of that. And then what's interesting as well, just by reference point, is this started with the FSB looking at the derivatives market. Because notionally, that's where all of the activity is at. And so part of what is interesting is the alternative reference rates that were developed were initially developed because they were well suited for the derivatives market. And I think they are finding some very creative and helpful ways to now use them for other purposes. But part of the reason we're doing that is there was a history where just because the derivatives market were so much larger, that's where international regulators and even domestic regulators initially focused. And it wasn't until we had the speech in 2017 by, by Andrew Bailey, who was he who's head of the the UK FCA saying, after this point in time, this is December 31st, 2021 <laughs> point in time, we're not going to use our regulatory authority to compel panel banks. So we don't know for sure it's going to come to an end, but effectively, subsequent st statements have been even stronger to that effect that, look, I'm not going to use my authority to force the creation of this rate. 
And so there's a lot of un other noise going on, but I want to provide a little more color on the background because I think a lot of the questions people have about what's going on now can actually be understood not by looking at what's going on now, but, but by understanding a, a little more of how we got here. And I will pass it on. Great. There you go. Good. Well, uh, it's a joy to be on this panel with Kate and Tom, and uh, I thank uh, you for the opportunity to be here. I want to give you some more sense of the amazing amount of work that has been done in this private-public cooperation to a challenge which, as Tom well said, is equal to several wide. Okay, so let's go back to the creation of ARC 1.0, which I would say created and solved and work done. And now we're on ARC 2.0, and a lot of more hard work has to be done. <clears throat> Let me start where Kate left off. So one of the questions we get, we did get, um, when we presented this to the uh, advisory board, to the, to, F, to the Office of Financial Research for FSOC, was, well, really, why can't we just use LIBOR? Um, why can't the banks just keep on producing LIBOR? And the problem is that we in the U.S., neither the Fed nor any entity whatsoever can force that result. LIBOR is reported voluntarily by banks at the request of the Bank of England. And as you just heard, as of 2017, you heard that Andrew Bailey, the head of the UK FCA, makes it clear that the FCA, which is the authority which is currently uh, collecting the data, will not compel the banks to report anymore. And the banks themselves will not want to. They are currently being compelled to, but they will not want to. Why will they not want to? Because of the liability. Because they will then be liable for standing up to these are reference rates. Because this purports to be reference rates for hundreds of trillions of dollars of trade. So if there's any manipulation, if there's anything that's not really backed up, and of course there's very few underlying in this inverted pyramid, then in what sense is it representative? So a bank will not put itself in the position of making the impossible claim that these are representative. So we know that it is one of these very highly likely, can't say 100%, but the logic of it is that it's going away. And we even have a date by which it's going away. And that's not a date too far away from now, December 31st, 2021. And the problem is that there are hundreds of thousands of contracts and entities and individuals who are now contractually committed to using LIBOR. And those LIBOR contracts last way into the future. They last way beyond December 31st, 2021, when the reference rate to which the LIBOR in the contract will no longer exist. So what's the fallback language? The problem is that the fallback language is either non-existent or varies tremendously. And some of the fallback language goes to, well, whatever is the rate in the last LIBOR day of trading, that will be your rate going forward, which means that all adjustable rate trades become fixed rate trades thereon. <clears throat> Done. Finished with all adjustable rates. Second possibility is that it goes to the maximum allowable, which I believe is 9% which would change all these rates for, for example, the mortgage market into 9%. Again, we'd have a massive crisis, and it's not a massive crisis because, depending on the, how many loans, but it doesn't matter, even for the thousands, tens of thousands, and that's the third component. We don't know. We do not have a database of these contracts. It's every bank, every contractual situation on their own. So Tom made the point that we will take people off LIBOR and put them on SOFR, but we can't. They have to take themselves off, and they have to be incentivized to take themselves off. But it's a uh, collective action problem. 
because they must take themselves off to some common index so that there's liquidity. So that's the incredible, fabulous work that was done by ARC 1.0. And I must say, give credit to our supervisor with ours, our Fed, which convened this group and stepped out. Because it has to be voluntary. This has to be done voluntarily. The Fed cannot control this, cannot direct this. So it was, it, this is a cooperative, public-private exemplar that Tom has headed up and is heading up. The first job was to find an alternative that could be used by and would be the, the best optimal choice for uh, the majority of moving off of LIBOR to this alternative. And they did so. And there is very little dispute about that. Although we must note that the secured overnight financing rate, that is SOFR, is not a LIBOR. What do we mean by that? I'll come back in a moment. So uh, then the second really hard, so SOFR is a broad measure of the cost of borrowing cash overnight collateralized, and here's the key word, by treasury securities. So it has no bank credit component in it. It is risk-free. So that's where the word secured comes. Secured overnight financing rate, no credit risk. Whereas LIBOR and all its other IBOR, Singapore has a CYBOR, there's IBORs throughout the world, have an interbank overnight, and therefore they have a risk component depending on the perception of the risk. But again, it's a fairy tale because there is really no LIBOR. So there was, but what's now the alternative is a fiction, and it will go away. So SOFR is not a fiction. It's real, and it is being adopted. And it's a broad measure of the cost of borrowing cash overnight, again, collateralized by Treasury securities. And it is, and here's the key, key thing, currently published daily by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. So it's completely transparent. And uh, this is all to the work of ARC 1.0, which then issued a transition plan, which they're very, very far along. In fact, they're ahead of the timing of this. So let's go to, nonetheless, we're nowhere near where we need to be. So what are the impediments to the wide adoption? Because why not adopt it now? Why wait to December 30th? In which case, you know, you're going to have a problem calling your lawyer on New Year's Eve. So how, how, why not rapidly get this done? And the worst problem is not that people are not transferring their existing LIBOR contracts, but they're making new LIBOR contracts. So, uh, you know, the sophisticated management rule, which is if you're in a ditch, stop digging. But no, there is digging that's going on right now, deeper into this ditch. So what are the impediments? Well, there is path dependence. Financial intermediaries, clients, vendors are using it. And there are the contractual basis for using it is often not two-way, but three-way or four-way. So it is a transaction nightmare to clear up the, ex the existing contracts. And then it is so easy, once you have your stack of contracts and methods of doing this, just to roll them over. So shifting to a new benchmark is large-scale coordination on the micro <coughs> among all your contactees, as well as macro. Secondly, and here is a problem that folks bring up. I think it's a red herring. But they bring it up and they say, so far is not a LIBOR. And they love LIBOR. So far exhibits, for example, quarter and year and spikes because of trading frictions. And uh, that can happen. But it can be managed because there's no reason why you can't have an average as opposed to a one-day SOFR that you use for your, um, for, for your um, link. And that is, in fact, where ARC has come down to suggest such an average. Uh, there are details then, though. What kind of average? Is it compounded? Is it arithmetic? It certainly would make more sense to be compounded. But the software isn't quite there yet in some firms, believe it or not. Other firms, of course, you would think the major firms are onto this. 
and they are dealing with this. And this is one of the, um, uh, in a previous panel here at NYU, uh, one of the, uh, that ARC put on, one of the eye-opening comments to me is uh, two banks were represented. <coughs> one expects over 100,000 people to be involved to touch this problem. And they have thousands on it right now. So this is major banks. So this, but the question is, what about the second tier banks and the regional banks and the community banks? So um, the second issue besides these spikes, which can be dealt with, is LIBOR, as I mentioned before, is an IBOR. It has risk in it. And um, so, and so for doesn't. So, so for um, will not give you that risk premium which can change over time. That is not necessarily a major impediment because the initial pricing of the whatever it is the instrument can reflect that difference. But again, it's something new and different. Again, so for finally third problem is that so for forward term rates are not available yet. So forward LIBOR, we still have forward looking rates. They're not real, but they exist. So for forward looking term rates are not yet available. Uh, this again is not a problem for the large banks because they'll be able to create their own derivatives and they'll be able to do internal pricing. So this is not going to be an issue. But off the shelf, um, forward looking term rates, not yet there. Why not? Because we need to have, and they, we will have them, by the way, day by day that that is being developed. But we don't need them day by day. We need them minute by minute. And for that, we need volume. So here we are back to the path dependency problem. We need SOFR, and we need SOFR in volume. So what's the reality? And I love this slide, which I, is totally due to Kate's work. So here, that red line on the bottom is Google Trends. All these are Google Trends of mention of LIBOR and SOFR. And the, um, Andrew Bailey, as you heard, in 2017 gave a speech. Well, um, the references at that point after the speech to LIBOR went down and then went up extremely slightly. Uh, what about SOFR? That's not a red horizontal line. That is references on Google to SOFR. So we have a major awareness problem. Great. Well, first, join me in thanking the panelists for their initial presentations. And now this is your chance as the audience to jump in and start asking questions. So I need to bring that up. There we go. So once again, go to slido.com, uh, enter, join uh, with the, the uh, code 4444. And by the way, to submit a question, you need to provide your full name. The one thing we do filter out are people who don't provide their full name for a question. So if you want your question to pop up, provide your full name. And please do vote on the other questions, because that's how we sort of focus on what's most important. So I'm going to start off with a question right at the top. Um, each of you have mentioned the end of 2021 as the end date for LIBOR. But there's some uncertainty about that date. And could you explain? two things. One is, why might there be uncertainty? And how does the uncertainty affect the transition? Who would like to jump in? I'll take a crack at that. I think, you know, when we think about these, this, these sizable uh, projects in the financial markets, right, you look at the euro conversion. The euro conversion was going to happen on December 31st, 1998, and that was a date. Y2K was a date. We knew these things. The, the financial industry uh, is, is very good at dealing with deadlines. You know, we don't necessarily get started right away, but we certainly finish on time. And uh, I think that what we saw with LIBOR was, uh, I think as, uh, as has been described here, the idea is that there are 19 panel banks that are currently have been asked to stay on the panel to continue to provide these rates, understanding that from a perspective of litigation, from a perspective of risk, they most likely, you would think, is not a really good reason to continue to do that. So the FCA, Andrew Bailey, as has been discussed, had asked the 19 banks to remain on the panel until December 31st, uh, 2021. 
And although, uh, although the FCA in, uh, in London has the power to compel those banks to stay, he made it very clear he will not use that power one day longer. So you have to really kind of play it out and say, okay, on that day, what banks will want to leave that panel and reduce that litigation risk? What will the regulator have to do? And the regulator at that point has to actually reaffirm if the rate is representative. So if five of the 19 banks leave, they have to come back and make that statement. So as, as that population dwindles or they all leave together, uh, that's sort of how we get to that date. So for the most part, we believe that the rate will be you know, either, either extinct or irrelevant. And when we think about it from a risk management perspective, uh, it is the only date that people can deal with from a risk management perspective. You can speculate on what may or may not happen. Uh, deadlines have obviously been slipped in other initiatives. But this one, you really have to say, what would make the banks continue to want to submit to these panels with the risk that they take, and the risk that they've already, by the way, paid for in many ways in the past. So if you use that, take that practical logic, that takes it to the regulator who has to say, okay, a bunch of banks just left. Is this a representative rate? If he says, no, it is not, that begins triggering the end of LIBOR. So that's why we, you know, we can't really see any way that this would continue on as banks leave the panel, as the regulator has to declare representativeness. And at that point, we think that's certainly at a minimum, uh, even when this debate was raging back in 2012, the idea was once Andrew Bailey made that statement in 2017, we all from a risk management view have to think about the end of 2021. There is another wrinkle, which is that this is UK and the FCA is a UK's authority. The UK has their own transition plans, and they're using an instrument, SONIA, which is a LIBOR, which does have a risk component. And they're way ahead of us. And the reason they're way ahead of us is not because they are just fast or whatever. They started way earlier. SONIA has been in existence way longer. So they will have an alternative, and we cannot compel the British banks to report, and we can't re compel the FCA to change its plan. Kate, did you want to add anything? Or? I don't know if there's that much to add. I mean, I think what, what Tom said hit the point directly is that there's an asymmetry in terms of the regulatory authority. The regulator has the authority currently to compel. The regulator does not have authority to say, you cannot submit. So the regulator can't affirmatively say, I'm 100% confident that you're going to do this because there's an asymmetry in their authority, but it was already laid out, there's reasons to suspect banks' incentives are gonna change. I mean, the other complicating factor, going back to the threshold question, is just people are very used to LIBOR. They really like LIBOR, and there are some market actors who've been really trying to push ways to keep LIBOR alive, despite the structural challenges that we're thinking about, because it's gonna either make their lives a lot easier, or there's specific opportunistic reasons because of what their portfolio or or other things look like, that they want LIBOR to continue to exist. And also the, the particular reference rate, uh, there, there, there's a, a particular body that wants this reference rate to live on for a particular reason. So there's, there's the, to say that it's better for everybody if you plan, that's true. But whenever you're undergoing a massive transition, there's going to be some people who benefit from alternative things happening. So I'd say the biggest problem is just this asymmetry of regulatory authority, which means they can't 100% guarantee anything. They can only guarantee that they're not going to use their authority, coupled with the fact that you have troublemakers and other people who are very happy to listen to the troublemakers because it, it makes their life easier. And, and I'll follow, <laughs> follow up with one other point. It's not that the only alternative is SOFR. So for example, in mortgage markets, 60% of adjust rate mortgages are tied to LIBOR. But 40% are not. So you could think, well, and they're not tied to SOFR. They're tied to treasuries, for example. They're tied to um, uh, uh, cost of funds, cost of funds of, uh, of particular banks, and also cost of funds of, uh, of groupings of banks. So you could think that that, well, OK, well, I was going to go away. We'll switch to one of those. But even that is not happening. So the problem is that there needs to be widespread recognition that this actually is a problem, even with relatively small time lenders, let's say, in terms of their contracts. And they need to be building in new language, fallback language, fallback language that identifies an alternative that they are happy with. So this is a major co coordination problem because this new whatever it is they sign on to, 
will affect adjustable rate mortgages, for example, but it's not just in residential, it's in commercial, and it's all sorts of, uh, not just mortgages, all sorts of instruments, which have borrowers on the other side who have to agree to this. So this kind of agreement and transaction, but nonetheless, it has to be done because as we just laid out, we have no control. There is no way of saying, okay, you haven't done it, we'll postpone the date. We can't do that in the U.S. Just a point of fact, it's worth mentioning that um, the ARRC that Tom leads has already proposed standardized fallback language for a whole range of contracts, and the ISDA, on whose board he serves, is working to propose standardized fallback language for derivatives. That will be key because, as you saw from Kate's chart, 95% uh, of the outstandings in terms of notional value in LIBOR, that are LIBOR-linked are in the derivatives world. Um, okay, so the next question is about whether you could end up in a world where both LIBOR and SOFR sort of um, live together. Um, could you find that LIBOR and SOFR swaps coexist to serve different clientels? You know, I, I think when, when it, it all involves looking at the, the, the current structure of LIBOR and, and for responsible participants in the market, for people to really look and say, is this something that I want to reference anything to? And LIBOR in its current form with the lack of underlying transactions really is reliant on these uh, estimates that come in from the panel bank. So the question comes down to what is the comfort level? What degrees of risk do people in the market today have? And that goes all the way through from, you know, from banks to insurance companies and everyone else uh, along the way, uh, central counterparties and ultimately consumers. And what degree of risk are people willing to take with current LIBOR? When you really started kicking the tires, I think as global regulators found, that it's not, a, it's not sustainable. Uh, it doesn't really reference anything because there are no really underlying transactions to support it. So if you look at that and you look at SOFR, which has on a daily basis well over, well over a trillion dollars in actual trades that are taking place, you know, what pillar do you want to actually base uh, your activity on? And I think that when we think about how uh, you know, how the world will look at LIBOR, it's like, what, what, what is the benefit of staying in this? And I think it's been mentioned, there's huge inertia to the status quo. And for a business that claims to be really dynamic, you don't really like change all that much. So I think when you, when you really think about, you know, what, how we've gotten here, it is, this is embedded in every system. This is embedded uh, across every bank, across mortgages, and, and somewhere, in, you know, somewhere in your personal life, there is a thing that says LIBOR that will impact you and I think when we start thinking about how we got here, it's really incumbent, I think, on on, the, on leaders in the market to begin to say, this is not sustainable. This seems to be this, the, the the best alternative, and taking that forward. Uh, looking at a world where we bifurcate the market uh, and leave leave activity on something, I think we all could agree is not is not sustainable. Does not seem like a, a responsible path forward. Uh, but there have been a lot of discussions about in a world where LIBOR continues to be published post 2021, and banks want to continue to submit. We don't see that. We don't see that path. Uh, but I mean, anything's possible. But certainly, I think the best way forward for the financial stability aspects of this is to uh, get everyone on rates that are durable and are supported by underlying transparent transactions. So, if I, I may answer the question, and there's a simple answer: No, it's not possible. Not in the derivatives world. There needs to be one common index. But that's not to say that there can't be indexes for different purposes. So for mortgages, absolutely. Right now, as I said, not, a, not all mortgages, only 60% are using LIBOR. So you, there could be an instrument, for example, a Maribor. Maribor is actively being put together right now, which is a, a rate which combines uh, lending rates across many institutions, which has credit risk. It's a very, very small right now, but for mortgages, that, it, that might very well work. It certainly would not work for derivatives. So the answer, in short, is no. And the second issue, sec secondary answer is yes, uh, not, not for derivatives, but for specific contracts, choose any. Choose any alternative, but choose. I, mean, I guess I'm just going to reiterate what was already said, but it's an important distinction, is there's the threshold challenge we face right now, and then there's the long-term question of what the reference rate landscape is going to look like. And there is questions of whether or not long-term there's a possibility for other rates 
to, to use, to, to come forward. And there are particular actors who are right now trying to formulate those other rates, particularly rates that might have some of the components that the people got used to in LIBOR. But one of the things I think we've all been trying to emphasize is LIBOR or anything that looks a lot like LIBOR is gonna depend on banks funding themselves in a way that is not how banks currently fund themselves. And to be able to get past this, this massive transition where LIBOR ceases to be a reliable reference rate and in some foreseeable period of time, the most important thing to make that, that as smooth as possible and to reduce the, the probability or possibility of systemic disruption is for there to be another reference rate where there is very active uh, market and you have meaningful liquidity in that alternative space. So it's not about saying, because like, I think there's a controversy right now, our, you know, our regulators, when they're kind of raising these questions, choosing a winner in what should be more of a competitive market process, and I don't think anybody's all arguing that maybe at some point there might not be alternatives that come up and complement and, and that you end up long term with an environment where you don't have quite the synergies that you have right now because everybody's using LIBOR, even in situations where they don't need something like bank credit risk, yeah, right. they just got used to using it, so that's what they're using. So the future landscape might look differently, but I think the, the focus, if you care about financial resilience, which is tends to be my focus, is we need a way to get over this hump. And the, to make that happen, the first thing we have to do is at least make as much activity as possible in something else that is viable. So far, is at least a, a very viable uh, alternative. So it's not trying to foreclose other options, but say, you have to come up with a plan, you have to move quickly, and, and this is likely what you're gonna adopt in the short run, even if long term you wanna get more creative, or for banks, for example, in the, the mortgage space, you know, they wanna use Prime or, or some kind of alternative. Um, the next question appears to be skeptical in it, but it includes a variety of pieces, <laughs> so let me, uh, let me try and bring it, to, read it to you and see which part you'd like to pick up. Do you think a switch to SOFR is worth the drastic impact on contracts with variable interest rates that will essentially become fixed after 2021? I mean, I think basically, as, as Susan already alluded to, the, the suggestion of using SOFR in lieu of LIBOR is a way of making sure that contracts that have floating interest rates continue to have floating interest rates that continue to have variable mm -hmm. interest rates. The concern is, and again, it varies. There's heterogeneity at times within contract types, but there's also variation across different contract types. But as she was alluding to, there's at least some contracts out there where the language that was drafted was drafted to deal with a temporary cessation of library. So there was like, what if there's a 9-11, but it's London rather than New York that's hit, and suddenly we have three days without LIBOR. So that was the, the contingency that they were trying to address. And so the way they addressed that contingency was to say, if LIBOR ceases to become available, you're gonna to continue to have the, the LIBOR rate that was the last LIBOR rate. But it was meant to deal with an understanding of a temporary cessation. There are open questions how a court would interpret that language. So we don't know for sure that those things are all gonna suddenly become fixed rate instruments. Right. But if a court chooses to take a formalistic approach to contract interpretation, which sometimes they will with sophisticated parties, again, it's not sure that they would in this circumstance, then there is a possibility that you would go from having a floating rate instrument to, to one that is fixed. But, but that has nothing to do with SOFR. SOFR is what's gonna save us from that happening in the backup language. It's not SOFR itself. Yeah. It's, it's appropriate backup language that deals with a situation where we're actually working, moving away from LIBOR uh, in a way where we understand the, the current risks. So every, the every triggers product, look better. Yeah, every product has its own set of fallbacks. So when you think about, uh, I, I think as we heard here, the uh, best way out of a hole is to stop digging. New production is the easiest way to reduce exposure, right? So if you have 100 units of exposure and, you know, you're, and, and your activity is rolling down and, and your liabilities are maturing, uh, your assets are maturing, at some point if you're using the new rates soon enough, you have a, a lower amount of uh, activity that you have to actually work these fallbacks through. But if you take it product by product, in each case, there's a different outcome. So a floating rate note that someone bought with a, a five-year floating rate note that references LIBOR, uh, at the end of 2021, that will convert to fixed. Did the uh, buyer of that really want to buy a fixed rate product? Most likely not. Does the contract stipulate that that's what it says? Yes, and it will probably find its way into a, a courtroom somewhere. Whereas derivatives, because of the nature of them, you can amend those derivatives. So you have a 50-year derivative, uh, you know, the ISDA will come out with a protocol. It'll say 
although currently it says when LIBOR goes away, call four LIBOR banks who probably won't answer the phone. Uh, now you get to the point where you're gonna, it's going to say go to the SOFA, adjust it for credit, adjust it for term, and you'll have basically a softer landing. So uh, loans can be amended. Uh, floating rate notes can't without 100% bondholder approval. Uh, and then there's a variety of, I think, what Andrew Bailey refers to as the tough legacy, things that just don't have any fallbacks whatsoever, things that have been written many, many years ago that don't contemplate this. And, and as Kate says, the idea that, that you know, anything around LIBOR was, that, that it was the usual, well, if there's no LIBOR, dot, 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 and everything else is going to be bad. The fact is, there will be no LIBOR. We will have to deal with it. And there's an enormous amount of legacy activity that will drop to fallbacks that are probably, uh, you know, in many cases, uh, unknown what those outcomes would be. They create major disputes and, 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 and legal. To, and, and really, as you look at it today, looking at those fallbacks, in many cases, it's unclear which side of that contract is actually advantage or disadvantage. And in fact, many cases, both sides could in fact be short a lottery ticket. And I think that's <laughs> sort of what we, we, you know, why you want to get to this stuff soon. So the things that you can remediate contractually, we're encouraging uh, people in the market to do that. Where you can stop digging the hole uh, and using new production on the new rates, we're encouraging that. But uh, yeah, I think, I think the idea, I, I agree with you, Kate, that SOFR is sort of, the, it's more of the, the, the life preserver than the problem. And things that will convert to fixed rate to people, pensions, and, and others who bought something they thought was a floating rate note. And in fact, if they can't own it, they have to sell it, and that could create some capital destruction as well. There may be a fundamental uh, point that we're, that we're not making carefully enough, which is uh, there's a contractual problem. We've, we've made that point, that the contracts don't specify, well, when LIBOR is no longer, then go to SOFR. But if they did, there would be no problem, because SOFR is very, a very good replacement for LIBOR. Those who sign on to these contracts want variable rates that vary with interest rates. That's the point with treasuries, for example, and SOFR does. So SOFR varies with interest rates, so it enables the lender, the creditor, to uh, be safe from. It provides them with a shelter against interest rate risk. So just like LIBOR did that, but SOFR does it just as well. As a lender, I, of course, want my premium over treasury, but then what happens if treasury increases? So I don't want a fixed rate. I want my rate to go up if inflation goes up and or if overall interest rates go up. I want my interest rate to go up. And SOFR does that. So SOFR moves with treasuries and therefore protects lenders against interest rate risk associated with inflation and overall real treasury movements and rates. Great. Um, we've got at least three questions that are related to how you go from an overnight rate, like SOFR, to a term structure. Now, just keep in mind, um, the ARC has a paced transition schedule on the web, and if I remember correctly, uh, it's expected that there will be a term SOFR swap market by the second half of 2021, which is sort of cutting it short a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, but the question is, I guess, two questions. Why does it take so long to develop a term market? Mm -hmm. And how do you think it's going to be done? How are people going to do that? So it really, the, the, the drivers of that really are there. Again, we talk about inertia to the status quo. People like the idea of a forward-looking term rate. But a forward-looking term rate really just reflects you know, the assumed path of interest rates going forward. Uh, what we believe, at the, I think the ARC feels really strongly, is that a, a large majority of the market can rest on an overnight SOFA rate. And uh, a significant part of the market can rest on a compounded in advance or compounded in arrears SOFA rate. So uh, you might want to slow down and explain sorry. those two. Uh, okay. <laughs> now I'm getting, getting the question now. So uh, compounded in arrears rate basically says that we would say if we had a floating rate note, uh, we would say at the end of the period we would look at, let's say it was a quarterly payout, we'd look at 90 SOFAs, we would compound that interest, and and two days later we would pay that interest amount. So that really, when you think about that, is for more sophisticated products and where people have the ability to compound interest. So a compounded and a rear sofa really is, is, is someone who needs term, would like to reflect term, but is going to get the actual daily rates compounded at one payment at the end. So there's not a, not a series of overnight if, if transactions. If I may, so yeah, for sure. example, uh, 
I have a mortgage, and it's a variable rate mortgage, and it's linked to the LIBOR. It's linked to SOFR, but right now there's no forward SOFR. So how will I know next month what will I pay? Well, next month I will pay the daily SOFR rate compounded, and perhaps two days before my mortgage is due, mm -hmm. that rate will be told to me. So you can see that this is for sophisticated uh, borrowers, this right. is just not a problem at all. They'll be able to track it every day and it will be infin infinitesimally different. They're, they're going to know what it is. But for average um, Joe and Mary who are, have a mortgage, maybe they need to know, it will just be a question of dollars and pennies, but still maybe they'd like to know what it is, which is why it would be useful if there were a forward rate that could be charged every month and not only forward one month, but forward three months, forward six months, and even forward a year. And, and one intermediate solution to that for consumers who do need a certainty of payment well in advance is also a compounded and advanced SOFR. So the idea would be you would take the last three months, that would, you would calculate that, and that would be the payment that the lender would pay three months hence. Right, so the idea that you know for consumer products and particularly in any retail product, there's, uh, we, we, we certainly don't believe at the art that anyone wants to get a two-day notice on what their payment on their mortgage is. They'd like to know that in advance so they can do financial planning around it. So the idea would be if you said I can get a vast majority of derivatives market on overnight SOFR, I can get uh, some portion of the floating rate note and some of the loan market on SOFR compounded in arrears. I potentially could get some consumer products on SOFR compounded in advance. All of that now is resting on probably the most durable pil pillar, which is this 1.2 trillion in activity, is supporting a vast majority of the market. A forward-looking term will be based on derivative transactions and other things that need to occur. So again, this is a bit of a, a, a yet another chicken and egg on this topic, which is you got to get people using SOFR in the derivatives markets, in the futures markets, to create enough activity to actually bootstrap a curve that you could use for forward term. But at the end of this, uh, assuming that that will probably be the lowest volume piece of this, at the end of this, I think that the ARC would feel that the work, uh, it would not be complete to have too much of the market resting on a forward-looking term basis because it probably has the least underlying transactions. So the goal would be if you took the U.S. 200 trillion, you know, you'd want to see a vast majority of that, you know, 180 plus sort of sitting on these first two pillars of SOFR overnight and SOFR compounded. And then the last piece for those who truly need term, uh, and I, I think that this is really something that uh, Andrew Bailey has spoken on as well, which is there are parts of the market that just need a forward-looking term curve. But if you really think about it, and you and you uh, and, and and as has been mentioned on the on the uh, Arc website, we do have uses of SOFR and a lot of graphs and charts that really say when you really follow the path of interest rates over time, the distributions aren't that wide. And 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 so it's really again inertia with the status quo, getting people comfortable with new ways of doing things, and and arriving at reasonably similar outcomes uh, if, if we get it right. Great, thank you. Um, so one question from a student is about what the potential size of the SOFR linked market would be. Is 200 trillion for LIBOR a good benchmark for making that judgment? Yeah, I think, I think what we've seen is that as this, as this uh, issue has really come to the forefront, I'd say over the last two years, uh, we have seen people taking action. When, when you really look at your own risk management practices, you know, people are looking at their exposures, they want to reduce those exposures where they can, where it doesn't cost a lot. So people are kind of, uh, you know, approaching the low-hanging fruit. So I would think that, you know, we've seen more fixed issuance uh, than we have in the past. Those who typically issue floaters uh, have been reluctant to issue floaters beyond 2021 that reference LIBOR, or they've begun using some of the common ARC language that we put out that create better fallback. So I think it would be probably some subset of what we see today uh, as people begin to really think about what the alternatives are. But it's certainly a, a reasonable measuring stick to think that a, a vast majority of that activity would move uh, onto these new rates, as, and particularly through new production uh, over time. Great. Right. Um, there's been some talk in markets and, and uh, also on the part of regulators about the potential for an early cessation of LIBOR. Yeah. That is, it might happen before to the end of 2021. And one of the questions here is about whether as people begin to transition away from LIBOR, will it become even less reliable? Could that lead to an early cessation? I, I'd say there's, there's, two, there's two points there. The first one is, 
as, as market participants begin using SOFR in earnest, then there will be less LIBOR activity, and LIBOR, by definition, the rate itself will become less liquid, the activity in, under, in LIBOR. Uh, I think that the, the, an early cessation would create a series of you know, unanticipated outcomes and would not be pretty as the way we see it right now. But I do think there's a difference between uh, the underlying volume uh, in, in, in LIBOR that drives that. That's not going to change. The uses of LIBOR will mean that there will be less activity. Less activity should mean less liquidity because liquidity is drifting from, from LIBOR to SOFR. So when we think about incentives for people in the market, right now LIBOR is more liquid than SOFR. Right? If people need to act on the markets, they will, as, as, as you say, continue to use LIBOR uh, and will continue to do that. As that uh, shift begins, and SOFR becomes more liquid, then people will obviously pick the more liquid instrument to execute. So there will be a shift in liquidity, definitely, as we move down here. And what has been a discussion about, is there a first mover advantage? Uh, will there be, in fact, a negative to being a last mover? Great. Um, the ARRC 1.0, the one before you, um, spent a lot of time trying to figure out what would be the optimal replacement for LIBOR in the United States. And they were following a whole set of guidelines from groups like uh, uh, IOSCO, for example, the principles for establishing a new benchmark. And there's been a lot of research done by well-known finance specialists like Daryl Duffy on how to create good benchmarks. Um, how did the uh, ARRC 1.0 uh, go to SOFR? And what, what other alternatives were there? Why, for example, why not an alternative that had bank credit risk in it? Yeah. It really came down to volume. I think, I think when we, as people begin digging into this, you know, going back to 2014 at the inception of the, uh, of the ARC, uh, the question, it became very clear that the one thing we, no one wanted to do was to ever do this again. So with the size and scope of the challenge and with really people processing the, 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 the you know, enormity of this, uh, the idea was to find something that would be durable over time. So with, 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 uh, with, with the help of all the research, your choices could have been several things. You have uh, SOFR, which didn't exist, but the Treasury repo market, which underpins it, did. And it's very liquid and has been, even if you look back past the, beyond, beyond the crisis uh, and back, there has always been a vibrant U.S. Treasury repo market for the point that, 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 that Susan makes, which is that it's, it is risk, a risk-free rate. It's the risk-free asset. So the Treasury market, uh, that when we started aggregating those numbers and what was available with the work that the OFR and the New York Fed have done in actually getting that data, which was not designed to do SOFR, but the, but the data exercise that took place years back to actually get more transparency in the repo market act was incredibly beneficial to the ARC. So we looked at it and there was about 800 or 900 in daily activity in overnight Treasury repo, which stood out. The next thing in line would have been the overnight bank funding rate, which is Fed funds and euro dollars. That was floating in at around uh, 150. Uh, and after that, there were obviously some concerns about the lack of activity in the Fed funds market, which uh, is primarily not dominated by the GSEs. And although it used to be 100 or so billion a day, is now tracked sometimes between below 75. So when we looked at this with this, over, uh, with this you know, very uh, complicated principle of please don't make us do this again, we figured that the one with the, with the most volume, that was most durable, that we could look back over time and see, and see sort of the, all, the, uh, all the transparency points and understood it, it really stood out. There was no other choice. We looked at treasury bills, which were less than 10 billion. We looked at commercial paper, which would have had the, uh, and I think it was on one of the charts, commercial paper, which would, these are all like single digit numbers. So at the end of it, one, you know, which is now currently 1.2 trillion in activity, uh, seemed to be the most stable platform. And, uh, and the New York Fed, uh, in, 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 in very short order, created SOFR from a series of data points that have been collected by them in the uh, Office of Financial Research. Great. Um, one student points out that uh, the UK, in picking Sonia, has picked a, an, an IBOR uh, with a bank credit risk, whereas the US has gone the other way in choosing a risk-free rate. Um, is that going to cause problems in markets that have two different types of benchmarks? Hmm. People, are, it, people have an ability to price things, and I think the, at the end of it, uh, Reform Sonia does have a lot more activity underpinning it, so I think that there's been a lot of work done. I also believe that in these new, in these new risk-free reference rates, uh, there is, I think, a lot of room to add data as it becomes available. So new transactions potentially can be plugged into some of these things, which that wasn't the case because LIBOR was written so, uh, so in a, such a narrow definition. So there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle. But yes, yeah, secured and unsecured uh, uh, 
race will perform differently in times of stress. And I think people have to, you know, think about the distribution of outcomes as they price their activity. And it will be interesting. I mean, that's another thing for people to study and to trade and to take advantage of hedging opportunities. And we yeah. can't have Sonia. That's, it's, this is in dollars. We don't have such an instrument. So, um, so, so for will trade and so will Sonia and the pricing will diverge sometimes and it'll be profit opportunity. Most importantly, they're based on transactions, not, not guesses. <laughs> Do you foresee any challenges for using SOFR if interest rates are negative in the United States, below zero? I, again, I think, I think because it's transaction-based, I think it's got, you know, confidence and credibility will be high. And if we see a trillion two trading negative in the market, well, that's the rate. I mean, the thing about this is the rate is the rate. It's based on trades, uh, unlike, uh, you know, sort of, again, <laughs> Uh, you know, best estimates that are coming from the panel banks today, and and the buy and there's no, you know, there's really no ability to bias that. Right. Um, systemic risk. We've talked a good bit about you know how the end of 2021 is approaching, and institutions and, and markets and households even have to prepare for this change. What kind of risks exist for the financial system if the Preparations are incomplete and inadequate when LIBOR disappears. Well, I do think a, a big part of the risk, the ISDA, is, is related to derivatives. And if that's taken off the table, and I think by the very good work that has been done, and that Tom is doing right now, and that there's a whole army of people on it, I think that will be checked, and we'll do that. That'll get done. But that's not, so I, it's a very good question. It's actually my question, a question that I asked you, Kim. What do you think? Um, it's not something to be disregarded. It's not, so, but did we, what was Y2K? It was really the uncertainty around it. So the problem is that, you know, I, I don't see falling off the cliff. I don't see that. I, I do see that there can be confusion. I think there can be, the day after, well, what rate do I pay? Lots of phone calls, uh, legal demand. And I don't think it's going to be December 31st. I do think that um, six months prior, there's going to be a tremendous amount of activity. I think that there's going to be a whole army of expertise, lawyers, financiers, who are going to be absolutely rising to the challenge. And I, right now, I hate to bite my tongue, whatever, but of course it means that, that there would be a crisis if the army weren't there. And then, of course, it does depend on what else is happening on December 31st, 2021. <laughs> like, are we in the middle of a recession? So, we'll see. Yeah, I just want to add two things to that uh, and agree with all of it. I mean, one of the, the interesting twists here is that even though the derivatives market is 95% of the market, the, core, the challenge is multi-layered, but at its core is a coordination challenge. And one of the beauties in the derivatives market is because of ISDA, they already have, through this protocol mechanism, uh, a very eloquent way of trying to deal with both like forward-looking, but also for all of the existing contracts out there. And they have, they're doing this right now because they're reaching out to all of their members. So they're doing this very methodical way. So I mean, the question was partly also how you guys got to SOFR. I mean, it was a two-year process. I mean, one of the things that everybody has been careful about is like, let's make all of this a process. Let's enunciate what our standards are going to be. And then we're going to, it's kind of like notice and comment lawmaking. So like, I'm very used to the regulatory thing where, where ISDA will say like, here's our proposal, here are our questions. And then they're going out to their members. And what they're trying to do there is both educate their members and get by. So by the time they go through the protocol, everybody will already be on the same page. So, so part of what's really interesting is that that is the, the, the scary chunk of the market when you're looking at notionals, but you have a mechanism to deal with a coordination challenge. What's interesting here is these things also pervade all of these other spaces. And I think sometimes systemic risk arises because it's not where you're looking. So that's what we're looking at. That's what we're all focused on. But this is used in all kinds of unusual ways. I mean, Susan mentioned the one of the events that they had here. There was a corporate treasurer who mentioned 
And again, most large corporations are going to have internal cash management systems that they are not alone in using LIBOR for all of their internal cash flow transactions, right? So they have to figure out how to create a substitute for that if they need to. And he was quite honest, most treasurers, like this is just not what it is that's on their mind. And so I think what's interesting is not where we're focused on. I actually think the areas where we have the bright spotlight, we have the organization, while nominally they look like the scary spots, are going to be the ones where we're also making the greatest, greatest effort to, to fix those spots. But this pervades the system in very deep ways. We don't have a full light on all of those different corners. And I think once uncertainty comes into play, I mean, one of the interesting things in terms of how financial market works is once people have a lot of questions, and then things that they thought were going to work a certain way aren't working the way that they thought, it might not be an immediate process. It might be like, at first, things kind of look like they're going smoothly, and then suddenly people are having a hard time pricing things. I mean, one of the interesting challenges here is even with term, there is this pricing question, and the pricing, you know, and I don't think it's a big one, but banks might suddenly realize that they don't trust, going back to the point you don't know what's going on, that they don't trust their models quite as much as they thought because an IBOR versus a risk-free rate, and even in IBOR it's an overnight rate versus a, a three-month IBOR, which is why Sonia is you know, different but not all that different. Like, it's during times of stress that those spreads blow out, right? So if you're looking at like LIBOR versus the overnight index swap rate, it's like during the crisis that you're suddenly seeing a really big difference. So I mean, there's just, I think there's this inherent uncertainty, particularly if the smaller banks aren't thinking about it, the mid-sized banks aren't thinking about it. It could actually have effect on like the long-term viability of their banks if those are trying to figure it out. There's legal uncertainty here. So I think the more planning we do, the further we're gonna get along, but it is a coordination game of such a massive scale and it's something that has infiltrated the system in ways that people weren't even thinking about why they were using it. They just kind of pulled it off the shelf. Um, that I think those are the things that, that make me a little more curious. And, and the specific question of where we know there is potential risk is if an entity, a bank, has uh, LIBOR-based contracts and LIBOR is no longer trading or then the value of those contracts is what? And uh, the risk of those contracts has clearly gone up. So will they be, in terms of the assets of that financial entity, that bank, if these assets start trading at a discount, what is that discount? And how do we know what that discount is? And uh, right now we don't, and that's a bad thing. Right now the LIBOR old contracts are not trading at a discount, which says that the world right now thinks a LIBOR contract is just as good as a SOFOR-based contract. There's no pricing difference. And, but as we get closer, SOFOR will be a clean contract, one that both sides understand and have already committed to paying. But LIBOR will be one where there will be great uncertainty about what's, what will be paid. And that should be reflected in the pricing. If large banks, or any size banks, or large, I should say a large part of the banking system hasn't made the shift and does not know to the extent of its assets are going to be dinged because they're library based, well that would be a serious crisis. So I expect to hear uh, some very good feedback coming out of this September uh, FSOC meeting in terms of uh, getting a move on for the not just the uh, uh, large national banks, but the re regionals and the community where there is much less activity. In the UK, uh, a letter was put out by um, Bailey which said, we need to hear from you. So the onus was put back onto the banks, which of course are overseen uh, in, in the UK, just as they are in the US. Uh, for civility, and they said, you need to respond to us, to tell us you have your house in order, and that you know what, what percentage of your contracts are LIBOR, and you have a plan for fallback language. Such a letter has not gone out in the U.S., and I think there's a sense of, well, really, can we compel, but this is a private sector. Can we regulators compel this? Even if it's part of CCAR, uh, stress tests, which you know, we don't know whether it is or not, uh, that doesn't cover the, the ballpark, it doesn't cover all banks, and it certainly doesn't cover the smaller ones. So, uh, but it's an interesting thing to me on the outside that we have not, that our regulatory framework, our um, oversight group, 
the, FD, the, the Fed and OCC, et cetera, has not issued such a letter. Do you think they would? I, mean, I think that the, I think that there is there is going to be there seems to be a coordinated effort among global regulators to begin to uh, to get those questions answered, whether it be a formal dear CEO letter or in just normal supervisory uh, activities. I think that uh, at the at the at an FSB meeting, I think that the uh, vice chair Quarles referred to it as more muscular supervision. So I do think that as we go through this, I mean, an ideal solution is for the industry to solve this as best they can on their own. Uh, absent that, I would suspect that uh, that regulatory uh, the regulatory touch becomes a bit more prescriptive over time. I think that uh, history would tell us that anyway. Can I have a small comment? I, mean, I, just, I agree, but I actually I do think that the regulators are, are starting to signal, and I think there's multiple ways to signal. So it might be less formal than a dear CEO letter, but there have been public statements, and there's certainly sense of the supervisory tool starting with the large banks. Hopefully, we haven't seen as much, but filtering down. But then and again, going back to the pockets. The U.S. is very different. So it, in, in the U.K., when the Financial Conduct Authority issued this letter, it wasn't just to the banks. It was to all of the insurance companies. Because guess what? This is a huge issue for insurance companies as well. Mm -hmm. That was very easy for them to do because they have oversight over both. In the U.S., we don't have federal regulation of insurance companies. Those are regulated by the states. And again, as we saw during the crisis, it turns out insurance companies were doing a lot of things that their state-based regulators didn't fully understand the ramifications of, of, of the risk that they were taking on and might not have been on top of these issues in the same way. So it's just, like, for me, it's not that we don't have the regulatory tools in the spaces where people are actually properly regulated. It's other weaknesses, perhaps, in our, our regulatory framework. Well, that's been, first of all, join me in thanking our panelists for this. <laughs> Uh, I'd also like to just express a personal thanks to the ARRC, which is, as far as I'm concerned, the most productive private-public partnership I've ever seen. Thank so you thank much. you for doing that. Thank you. Thank you.